Hi folks, I'm going to give you a short supplement lecture about one particular kind of coping strategy and we are going to be connecting it to what we were talking about about stress. So here's a quick supplement for you. The first thing is stress is anything that is a reaction to a situation or a circumstance that is causing you um, to, to have more than you can deal with. So it could be environmental, it could be psychological, it could be situational or social, but there's lots of different reasons that we can be stressed and I think they're pretty familiar feelings for a lot of us. Now, when we are stressed, there are things that we wanna watch out for because long-term stress or extreme stress or chronic stress can all have pretty major impacts on our life and our well-being. So we try and cope and there are a lot of different ways that coping happens. Coping is any behavior that somebody can do in order to try and master or control stress, to try and make it more tolerable, or to try and reduce the stress itself or minimize how, bad it, how badly it's affecting you. So there's usually two different major categories that we split coping into. The first category is problem-focused coping. And this is where your, your coping strategy is to get rid of the source of stress, solve the problem, deal with the situation. Um, those are the longer term, more effective coping strategies um, in general because it, it nips it in the bud, it solves the problem um, so it cannot continue to be a problem. However, we all know that there are sometimes things that are outside of our control that we can't do anything about or that are completely intolerable or that are so intense that the bigger problem at the moment is how it's affecting you instead of the problem itself. So in that situation, a person might turn to emotion-focused coping. With emotion-focused coping, you are using the strategy of dealing with your own reaction to the stress instead of solving the problem of the stress itself. Now, as far as going out into nature goes, we know that there are pros and cons in general. So before I even get to the, um, the psychological research on the impact of, of nature on stress, let's think about nature just as a concept for a second. First of all, there's benefits. Um, you can feel better, your mood will improve if you are out in nature, it can reduce your stress and it can help you have more attention for the things that you need to be doing. I'm gonna focus there for the most of this little lecture supplement. But in general, it's also a great place for you to get exercise, have fun, and be away from a screen. So those kinds of things are benefits or upsides of being in nature. Now, there are a lot of different ways to experience natural environments. If you are in Alfred, you are in the middle of a beautiful rural area where there are lots of natural environments that you can get to by walking, by biking, by driving, by um, going even just a little bit outside of the village or campus. But there's also other ways that you can experience natural environments. So if you're not in Alfred, there might be a park near where you are or there might be places where you can visit um, on purpose, like state parks or natural forests or um, just kind of out into the, the wilderness. Now, anytime I say that, um, then a lot of you are gonna be going, wait a second, what about? And here are the downsides, of course. Um, when weather is extreme, being outside is unpleasant. So whether it's extremely hot or extremely cold or if we're having some sort of storm or whatever, there's lots of different things that um, can be part of um, the downside of being outside. Uh, second of all, if you're allergic to things that are outside, then being outside can be um, a circumstance that makes you feel sick. Um, you have to watch out for sunburn, as good as sun, uh, sunshine is for us. Um, there's obviously that line after which it's not good for us anymore. Um, you can't avoid the fact that there are bugs and animals outside and some of them want to bite you, some of them want to sting you, some of them want to eat you up. There's all sorts of different um, bugs and animals that 
differ in their um, level of unpleasantness or danger uh, and they are outside. Um, and then the last thing is being outside oftentimes is time consuming. So whether you're thinking of it as a break um, and you're just stepping outside for a minute or whether you're thinking about getting in a, a car and going to a natural national forest or something like that, it takes time. And so if you've got other responsibilities like work or family or school or whatever, um, going outside will definitely be time that you are not doing that. And that's part of the point, but it's also a potential downside. So in general, you have to realize that there's always pros and cons to everything. So being outside for everyone is not always safe for whatever reason. It's not always free. Um, if you're thinking about places where there's admissions, uh, admission costs or um, the cost of gas to get there or something like that, or available. Um, if you live in the middle of an urban or a city environment and there's not a good park next uh, nearby, then we're back to having to find one and go somewhere. So we're just acknowledging that. Now, thinking in terms of the coping strategy of using natural environments, um, we can think about nature therapy. So I'm going to share a um, couple of theories with you. The first theory that has gotten a lot of attention is <laughs> called attention restoration theory, art. So this particular theory talks about the way that our brain processes information coming in from our senses that um, produces a kind of thought that is either draining and takes a lot of energy or is restorative and makes you feel um, better afterwards. So the theory includes the terms soft fascination and hard fascination. And fascination, I want you to imagine looking at something. When a person is engaged in work, like they're, sorry about the train, when they are reading, um, if they're looking at a screen, if they are writing, if they are um, doing problems, like um, solving problems or trying to design something, that's hard fascination. It means that your focus is really um, on something closely. And oftentimes that means that it's something small and right in front of you. Like I'm looking at the screen right now, making this lecture supplement. The screen is a couple of feet from my face. I am indoors, but I'm really focused on the screen and I'm not thinking about the environment around me. My energy is all focused right here. Now that's hard fascination and that is tiring. We actually don't have infinite amounts of mental energy to spend on things. And so if you are studying, if you're thinking hard, if you're reading closely, that's all draining. That's why you feel tired afterwards. So the hard fascination is the kind of thing that uses up the mental energy that you have to spend and you have to take a break. On the other hand, soft fascination is where you are engaging in um, observation or experiences where your focus is a lot more diffuse. So think about being outside because that's what we're talking about and looking around to all sorts of different areas. You're looking at different distances. You might be looking at things that are close to you. You might be looking at the horizon far away your focus is in a lot of different places and it's kind of able to move around. You're also going to be taking in a lot of information that is coming from um, unconnected or unrelated sources where it can add into the sort of distraction that you're feeling. So if you are working on reading or a screen or writing or something like that, a lot of times you're trying to tune out what else is going on. Whereas if you are outside, maybe you are listening to the wind through the leaves or you're hearing birds um, sing or bugs fly by you, whatever it is. But in any case, soft fascination is restorative because it is taxing different parts of your brain compared to what is being used heavily with hard fascination kinds of tasks. So it allows you to kind of shift your energies. And while this stuff is sort of um, being replenished, the other side is um, being used. 
So attention restoration theory says exposure to natural scenery, especially, but experiences in particular um, will restore your attention abilities or, or reserves. There's also um, a much more uh, simple theory called stress reduction theory. And this one just says that when you are in a natural environment, your mood tends to improve. Um, and that could be because you increase positive feelings or because you decrease negative feelings and emotions. But either way, your mood improves. Um, and as you have um, those kinds of increased positive and decreased negative um, feelings, then you can return to processing information with your brain using higher order thinking instead of relying on um, more of your sort of lizard brain processing like anger and fear that are processed through the amygdala. The other thing about stress reduction theory is how it directly links to the fact that we know stress impacts your immune system. So if you are stressed out, your immune system is going to have a harder time fending off the cooties that you are exposed to, and you're gonna be more likely to get sick. It's gonna take longer for you to heal from injuries. It's gonna stunt your growth in a very literal sense. And so you want to think about stress reduction as um, a healthy behavior because stress influences your immune system. So when researchers in psychology examine these kinds of theories and to look for the kinds of evidence that support them and help them build these theories. They're looking at a couple of different kinds of natural exposure. So for instance, real life, like going outside, um, is different in a lot of respects from virtual nature exposure, looking at images, looking at uh, movies or videos, or even virtual reality. All of those kinds of things um, are common to people's experience though, so they've both been investigated. Here's some stuff that we found. The best impact or the most effective kind of natural environment that you can experience has specific characteristics. One, there are no human-made structures in your view. And that could be everything from uh, sidewalks or buildings or power lines or roads or things like that. If you are in a completely natural environment, that has the biggest impact on mood and attention. Um, you can even have a more impactful experience if that is the, the fully natural experience, if there is water in that um, environment where you are, especially moving water. Think about all of those apps that'll give you um, like things like white noise or um, soothing sounds to listen to. Lots of them include water like a babbling brook or raindrops falling on leaves. Anyway, this is the most impactful kind of environment that you could experience, uh, the best impact for mood and attention. Second place would be a natural environment where there is some human made structures involved. And in this case, um, you would just try to minimize them as much as possible. So even if you are in a park, as opposed to out in the, you know, the woods in the middle of a rural area, um, if you can make it so that you still are seeing mostly the, the natural environment, then that's, that's the, the beneficial version. Now, Obviously, we've got to think about reality. Looking outside means that you are inside a human-made structure and you are looking through glass or window screens or whatever, and you can see the fact that there are buildings and perhaps power lines or whatever. But even looking outside can take your brain away from the hard fascination processes that you were working on before and give you different depths of focus, give you multiple things to look at, or um, take your mind in terms of what it's thinking about um, off of work for a minute. Now, if you are in an environment where you are in the middle of a city, there's man-made, human-made structures all around you, then even things like being able to see a tree or looking at grass or lawns or, you know, manicured kinds of landscapes, um, environments, that's still better than nothing. 
So if you are in that kind of environment, you can still get the benefit of um, nature just by focusing on whatever um, open space or natural space can be around you. And I recognize that all these images are showing you summer images, um, but even things like the branches of a tree that are bare in the winter can still be something that'll be useful for you. All right, um, what about fake images? So here I have a picture of a mural that's on a wall and you can actually benefit from fake images, pictures, and um, things that are uh, presented to you even on a screen. Um, so even if you were looking at you know, natural images or photographs online, or if you had something on the wall like a poster or a picture framed, then those kinds of things can be useful for you. And there's even been some small but measurable impact of artificial kinds of natural scenes. So. It doesn't even have to be a perfect photographic recreation. It could be something like a painting and that can still have the kind of effect that is beneficial um, for two reasons. One, it makes you look away from whatever you were doing that was hard fascination. And two, it makes you think about something different um, and take it in in a, a softer way. So those are some things to think about in terms of comparisons. Now, Obviously, the, the most to the least, the most is a completely natural environment with moving water in it. And the least impactful would be something like um, a fake image with a painting or something like that, but it's still beneficial. So I'm going to show uh, a quick uh, video about a researcher who is talking about this. So what if there was a way to reduce stress, anxiety, and even depression with no negative side effects? Uh, it's not a prescription for a pill, but a prescription for nature. Fox 5's Kathleen Bates spoke with a world-renowned expert on nature therapy, and it's the topic of tonight's Nantero Files. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. If this is your brain on drugs, as the old PSA from the 1980s suggests, then this is your brain on nature. It occurs to me that you may not be able to hear the video if I'm on mute. Let me fix that. All you need is a 40 second Yes, then this is your brain on nature. There is now scientific proof that any interaction with nature causes real changes to the brain and it can reduce stress, anxiety, attention deficit disorder, even crime. It's amazing. You know, really how powerful plants can be in people's lives. I recently caught up with Dr. Christopher Dunn of Cornell University, who was addressing a conference of botanic garden directors from across the country on the healing value of gardens. Call it nature RX, nature prescription. And it doesn't take much time to reap the benefits. But there are some studies that show all you need is a 40 second exposure, and that's enough sometimes to change your mood or your attitude. Even a picture of nature can be enough or a view out the window of a green space or a tree to alter the brain and the medical community is paying attention. Kaiser Permanente is one uh, health company that's actually asking their doctors to consider writing prescriptions for nature instead of writing for a pill. Colleges that can be pressure cookers for students are also taking notice. So if a student is under stress, if it's because of the classes they're taking or financial stress, whatever the case may be, then the mental health counselor can instruct the student to just go out and take a walk, decompress. The calming effect can also be seen on a community scale. Take low-income areas riddled with crime. Researchers say just add green. And they found that just putting a park, a small park even in some of these low-income areas that maybe are just devoid of anything green, 
Reduce planting a few trees is enough to reduce crime, reduce stress, reduce domestic violence. Dr. Dunn says interacting with nature will also make you kinder to yourself and get your creative juices flowing, something the business world is starting to practice. What some companies are doing is mandating that kind of respite from work. Get out. You have to go out and take a walk and do something. Something longtime conservationist Lorne Nancaro definitely prescribed to. Well, the question is, will it be a great weekend to go out and perhaps enjoy nature at the Botanical Garden? Well, San Diego, you really can't. I mean, yeah. you go any day and it's wonderful. So. <laughs> So in that clip, you saw um, the person mentioned a little bit about even looking at nature images. And so I found a couple of different studies that looked deeper into some of these effects that we see. The first thing is, in terms of images, looking at images, your preference matters to how effective it is. People who like nature are going to have more of a beneficial impact on their mood compared to people who don't like nature. So if you are looking at images, then it is especially relevant to your preference. Now think about this though. It's a chicken and an egg problem. We don't know which is causal. Do you feel better because you like the stuff or do you like the stuff because you feel better when you look at it? Now, all of those kinds of questions are, are worth investigating experimentally, um, but it's, it's part of what we consider when we look at the claims that people make about um, the kind of impact something like nature exposure has on you. Also, I found another study that talked about how being in nature can help reduce rumination. Rumination is a behavior where you are continuously thinking about something, like it's stuck on your mind. Um, and most of the time when we're talking about rumination, we're talking about dwelling on unhappy thoughts or having something play over and over again in your mind that makes you sad or mad or scared or frustrated or whatever. So rumination is actually a symptom of depression, but it is also something that can contribute to depression beginning. So again, we're back with our chicken and egg. Um, depression and rumination go hand in hand either way. Now, being outside in a natural environment can diminish rumination. So there was a really great study that was looking at this particular effect. They found it was even an effect that was um, something that people in a city park could experience. It doesn't have to be full on, no human made structure available nature. But what they found um, when they compared it to people who were in non natural outside environments, so fully surrounded by buildings or pavement or um, you know, all, all directions have some sort of structure in them. Um, that one didn't have the same kind of effect. The key that they found in their research was distraction and feelings of awe. So if you are thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and you are stuck in your own head about something that is making you unhappy or upset, then being distracted from those thoughts is going to solve part of the problem. So that's kind of an obvious um, explanation there. But the awe part is also an important element. When we think about what makes us feel awe, when, what amazes or impresses us, finding a natural example isn't difficult. So you might be thinking, okay, I get the distress or the distracted stuff, that's easy enough to think about how you can distract yourself from what's stressing you out, but how do I do, how do I find something that causes me to feel awe? Well, I've got some ideas for you. There's small ways and there's big ways. So here's how you cultivate awe and here's how you can do it um, looking for natural kinds of things that are available wherever you are. So the first thing is look at how things are made. This is a picture of a thing uh, like a big pile of dirt that I found under an overpass in Hornell and I was walking along the, uh, the canal and this pile of dirt had had 
water from the road um, that was coming through cracks in the bridge, dripping on it. And I thought that it made it kind of look like like a, an ancient city, you know, like clay, cave dwellers or cl cliff dwellers. Um, and it was the coolest thing. And it was just a pile of dirt under an overpass, but it was neat to look at and um, made me sort of exercise my imagination for a minute. Also, you can look for patterns where you don't expect them. So um, this is a picture of a spider that I saw a couple weekends ago. And I think that spiders are scary and gross, but I had to look at this one and be like, okay, but that's kind of awesome. Also, this spider was literally the size of my thumb and I screamed first and then I took a picture, but it was impressive and amazing. I want you to consider color. Um, so thinking about, these are some flowers that I saw growing just in somebody's little side yard. This isn't, you know, nature forest size. This is just noticing these amazing blue flowers uh, that I saw in the neighborhood. Also, you can think about shape. Um, this flower was another one that I saw. It was just an actual wild sunflower. And it made me think about the shape of the petals and the shape of the leaves. Movement and arrangement are also things that we can look at. I saw this picture of a, uh, or I saw this stump and I had to take a picture of it. I was walking with a friend of mine. So she took a picture of me taking a picture of the stump, but I really liked the movement and the arrangement of the colors in the old wood. So there are lots of different things that you can see that are small that can cultivate awe. On the bigger scale, it's a lot easier, of course, as we think about big things being awesome. But you can think about a wide vista or a long view out towards the horizon. This was at the side of looking at a lake um, here in central New York. Uh, this was Canada's Lake and it's beautiful. And you can just, you feel like you can see forever. Look away from, um, the the screen and and you know get outside you can still see kinds of awesome amazing things but even if there are human-made structures in it like these are the train tracks behind my house so looking at the sunset at the end of the train tracks and thinking about that light reflecting off of the steel that was pretty great i really i was really pleased with that um so thinking about uh the kinds of things that constitute human made structures uh, you can still find beauty and, and be amazed by things, um, even if that's in view. Here's another one. Um, this is a cemetery that is right by where I live. That's me uh, walking out in front. I was in a, a walk with my friend. But there were just carpets and carpets of little tiny flowers, little forget-me-nots. And it made me think about um, the fact of a forget-me-not in a cemetery. Uh, thinking about systems, thinking about time passing, that can make you feel awe. So when we're looking at things, we don't have to go far. This is again, right by the, uh, right in Hornell, I'm standing by the canal that goes straight through town. On either side of me, outside of the, um, the picture, is road and neighborhood and buildings and, and it's not even necessarily quiet, but I am able to feel awe for the, the horizon that I saw and the big clouds and the big sky. So there's lots of different ways to cultivate awe, even in the middle of town. Now I talked about movement. I took this video just of me looking at the treetops and the clouds falling over the, um, the sky. And I was just laying in the ground on the ground watching the sky in Alfred. And so this is what I talk about when I mean soft fascination. You can see the branches waving in the breeze. Obviously you can see when bugs fly in front of the screen. I was outside, but just watching the clouds go overhead and, and be so dramatic, that's an awe-inspiring feeling and I got it right in Alfred. So thinking about the ways that um, we can look to our environment and find big and small ways that we can cultivate awe. That's something that can help you feel better and feel restored. All right, so there's big and small ways. Um, again, right in Alfred, this um, doesn't always have to be outside. You can take natural elements and bring them inside. Looking at flowers shining in sunshine, this is 
uh, this is the same kind of thing that you can uh, use to help yourself have a mood restored. Um, this other picture of, of trees, right again, I'm right inside of Alfred. This was last weekend. So you can think about color, you can think about size and scale and the kind of stuff that makes us feel amazed by things. Now, all of that being said, um, there is real research to suggest um, all sorts of different kinds of benefits for exposure to nature. If you are in Alfred, there are trails that are right by campus. There are um, lawns and um, trees and things that you can go out and visit on campus. If you are stuck inside, you can look out the window. If you are only um, with a window that you can look out onto another human-made structure. Even things like an image on the computer uh, can help you feel better or a, a picture on the wall. So I'll leave you with one last thing that's a little bit silly and um, encourage you to take advantage of nature therapy. Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? I did. I was looking for a reason to live. Hi, are you feeling tired, irritable, stressed out? Well, you might consider nature. From the people that brought you getting outside comes prescription strength nature, a non-harmful medication shown to relieve the crippling symptoms of modern life. Nature's recommended for humans of all ages, and it's great for pets too. Nature can reduce cynicism, meaninglessness, anal retentiveness, and murderous rage. In clinical studies, nature has proven to decrease work-induced catatonia. Caution. Nature may cause you to slow down, quit your job, or seriously consider what the f*** you're doing with your life. If you are overly cynical, jaded, or emotionally numb, you may need to increase your dose of nature. Do you have trouble being even mildly uncomfortable? Nature may not be right for you. Side effects may include spontaneous euphoria, taking yourself less seriously, and being in a good mood for no apparent reason. So ask your doctor if nature is right for you. All right, I'll see you around. <laughs>